Okay, so uh, the purpose of this meeting and presentation is really the um, the AccuCut operator training. So um, what we're going to be covering today in the agenda is uh, again we just did our introductions, uh, but we're going to go through first and foremost machine safety. Um, really to talking about what how it's a very heavy and dangerous piece of machine and how to um, stay clear of things that can hurt you. Um, as well as uh, the machine anatomy or its nomenclature of you know how we call things so that when we're later then going into the operation you guys understand actually what I'm this I'm referring to which is an important part as well as then some basic operation and then going into some of the advanced controls um, of, of the machine um, then we're going to be doing any of the calibration and accuracy checks just to show you how to um, to check some of the things on a regular basis as well as then maintenance of the machine. Um, so diving into machine safety. Uh, well, actually, the, here's my really the, the introduction. So um, what I wanted to do was just have this information there so that when we provide you this presentation or slide deck, you guys would have this um, um, this information for, for later. But one of the things I w did wanted to point out was that for general questions, calling our uh, main line um, is the, the fastest way to get to someone, um, whether it's, you know, I, I, we publish our, our cell phones, um, but if we're out in the shop, we're not answering them um, if, if we're um, on, on the you know, production floor. So if you have a, a specific question quick that needs a quick answer, we're always going to be picking up the, the main line. Um, and what's nice about the main line is also we have the ability for you guys to text us pictures so that even though it's a landline, um, we can receive pictures that get then into our email um, so that we can help troubleshoot. Hey, I need this part. And if, even if you don't even know the name, name of the part, whatever it is, um, it's an easy way to be like, oh, yep, that's a take up. Yeah, we got that on the shelf. We can get it, get that to you tomorrow. Um, it's a quick way to, to start a conversation or to clarify if you don't know exact part numbers. So again, that's just that main line. If you, if you have to Google us, whatever, the, or even on the front of the machine, um, on the operator platform has that phone number, that 2338952. Anyway, so um, back into machine safety. This was not supposed to be on, that was a secondary. Um, there we go. This is what I wanted to really to dive into. It's pretty much like every other saw that you've probably worked with um, where hearing protection, proper PPE is important. So hearing protection uh, while operating the saw or working in the general area, um, it is recommended and uh, we want to see you also wear your eye protection and or face shield uh, whenever you're operating the saw or working in the general area. Sawdust and um, you know flying in trims or things like that are um, something that can can happen. So we want you to be safe both hearing eye um, in when, if you're in the area of of, of the saw. Um, what, which is part of what the quote unquote area really is for people who are walking up to it. So that's one of the things we recommend is number three is when de de designate an area for the saw and paint a, a yellow non entry line around the saw so that um, the operator is not actually operating the saw when it's when, when someone is walks into that. Let's say you had a visitor showing up that didn't know what was going on and um, you'd be able to kind of show them, hey, stay behind the yellow line. Um, and really, if you're able to set that within, you know, four feet of the of the saw, that would be within arm's reach so that if while, let's say, the lift arms were operating, um, it, there would be no pinch hazards, even if someone were to reach out and touch the saw because they'd be within four feet. So that's one thing to recommend number three. Um, continuing on, um, really, while on the operator platform, um, even though we have a safety door that's a mesh safety door, we recommend staying behind the, the saw's clear plastic shield, which is be directly between the operator panel and the saw itself. Um, that's just a much safer place than um, than anywhere else in the machine when operating close. Again, um, or not again, but go ahead and if you do have to go into the um, operator platform or off the operator platform through the safety door and onto the uh, the center section where the, all the saw is. Take out that turn off and take out that panel key with you and, and follow your, your lockout and tagout procedures so that you can shut off the safety so that there's no chance of someone accidentally hitting that um, saw chain start, you know, when you're trying to start a when you're trying to replace a, um, a saw chain, for instance. So 
really anytime you're going to be touching anything that's moving, you want to follow follow those lockout tagout procedures. Um, do not operate the saw if any of the guards have been removed. Let's say you had to remove a guard to, to uh, replace a motor or something like that. Um, you want to make sure all the guards are replaced before you're operating the saw again. Um, don't operate the saw if someone is outside the, the safety door on the center section of the <laughs> machine. Um, so if someone's actually on that center section near near it, um, you don't want to be operating the saw. Again, do, don't op operate a saw if, you're, if, if you know that someone's under the influence of drugs or alcohol, um, even if it's prescription or non-prescription, anything that can be uh, make you drowsy or um, influential, you don't want to be operating the saw. Same like um, any heavy, heavy equipment. Um, do not cut also any material for what is not associated with the wood products industry. So it's like, hey, I, I want to cut some of these, um, you know, plastic whatever pipes or whatever it is. It just, it, you know, just stick to what you're supposed to be cutting. Now that that's out of the way, I um, wanted to dive into machine nomenclature. So again, the, the machine itself is called an AccuCut. Um, some people call it a unit saw, a bunk saw. Um, there's lots of nomenclatures. You'll also hear us refer to 132. So 132 is actually the model name um, of, or the beginning model name of that saw. And the 132 is also, if you look at it, is 132nd, which is the accuracy of the mach machine, which is why it's 132. And, and so we refer to that um, as the overall machine. So if you see anywhere where we're saying AccuCut, Unit Saw 132, um, that's we're referring to the overall machine. But it also consists of a couple of major sub-assemblies. So your in-feed, your out-feed, your carriage, your operator platform, your center section, your saw box, your oiler, that's what we're all going to be covering um, here quickly. So if you look at um, really how the material, in this case, it's showing a left to right flow on this example, which is our most common flow. Um, there is a right to left flow, and I believe who, you guys do have a right to left flow material. So I use a, enough nomenclature to not say left to right, but it's, it's to say entry, in feed, and out feed to make it more universal. Um, so really, if you look at the in feed, is your your where you load the load the material onto the carriage. So the carriage is what travels along the rails. Through the through the machine from in feed to out feed and under the under the saw, and where that saw bar itself is located is really considered the center section. So that's what I'm referring to the center section is basically where the, where all the, the the is the kind of the heart of the heart of the machine the, the main area of the machine of where the saw's sawing is being taken place is the center section, and it's the dividing between the in feed and out feed, and the carriage travels between the two or between all three. The operator platform is basically hanging off of the center section and is what is where you stand to operate the, operate the machine itself. And <clears throat> please stop me if you if 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 I say something that is either you know is incorrect or if you have any questions, you know, I'm going to kind of dive through this because we have quite a few few slides to get through. So I don't want to take up too much of your time. So please stop me if there's any questions um, or clarification needed. So Again, we're going to start with the the in feed itself is here, with, which which is where the, the our backstop is. So the backstop is a set of upright rollers that allows you to square the machine, square the unit to the machine itself. And so that's where it gets loaded onto the the carriage that is not shown here, which I'll show you in a second. But those upright rollers are those yellow rollers in the, on the back feed or on the on the backstop. The rails are uh, the five by five. Um, tubes with inverted angle iron that act um, as a um, alignment rail for the carriage. And you'll hear us talking about pedestals, so I just wanted to point that out. As pedestals are, are the, essentially the, the three foot tall footings that the whole machine sits on. The carriage take up chain, so um, the carriage gets pulled by a chain in and out of the machine, and the tension is provided by the carriage take up unit which is on the in feed side of the machine. So on the out feed, it looks very similar, um, except uh, there's no backstop. You have the, rather than a take up, you actually have the carriage drive um, and you have these lift arms. What the lift arms are, we'll be, we'll be covering later, but essentially they will be able to lift the product that you've cut off of the carriage in order to be unloaded. Um, and allowed the carriage to then travel back without 
or while a after it has left the units on top of the uh, after on top of the um, the lift arms themselves. The lift arms are controlled hydraulically, which is the hydraulic um, cylinders to push them up are on the far right of the lift arm hydraulics. Depending on if you had um, an option, the hydraulics unit, the power unit is either directly below the lift arm hydraulics or it's near the center section, which is why it's not shown. So the carriage itself, the carriage is what, again, is, is what we place the unit of lumber on prior to um, that takes the unit of lumber through the machine. Um, the carriage itself is rides on six V wheels. We call them V wheels because they're not flat in the bottom, but they, they have a, a V groove um, that sit on those inverted angle iron uh, to make sure that this carriage stays straight as it rolls up and down the, 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 the rails. Um, the dunnage is what we refer to as um, it's just a, a, a nomenclature that sounds familiar that some people might not be familiar with, but it is the four by four pieces of wood or um, a, a four by four aluminum tubes that the units get placed onto when cutting. This allows the separation from the carriage to allow both the forks from the forklift to travel in and out, as well as it gives us clearance so that the saw chain doesn't cut into the carriage itself. A um, couple of important other features of the carriage um, are shown in the upper right your the gear rack. So the gear rack is the teeth of the gear rack are facing down that aren't shown in the, in the CAD model. But it is what spins your encoder with a little spur gear. So it's kind of like a, a, a almost like a steering wheel rack and pinion style. Whereas the carriage travels, it spins the um, the spur, the spur gear on the encoder and is what is to changes the linear motion into digital measurement. Now, what's important here is the small little piece on the in, in feed and out feed side of the or at the both ends of the carriage is that gear rack lead in. It's a little plastic piece that actually deflects the uh, gear rack down and into the teeth to make sure that the, those teeth and gear rack have a nice um, tight fit. Um, if the gear rack was hanging, um, if the or if the we'll get into that later. Um, it just it just gives us a nice tight fit between those. But if the, if that little piece ever breaks off, um, it could potentially causes some, some crashing. The front of the uh, the carriage is a scraper to help prevent any um, big chunks of sawdust, um, any any end trims that are laying on the uh, on the on, on the rails themselves, prevents any. Uh, it, it does its best to prevent any crashing, uh, but again, we want to I'll talk about later about cl clearing the end trims off of the uh, the area before moving the carriage. So um, that was the carriage. We now um, also on the operator platform, which is pretty self-explanatory, uh, but there is an operator door. So there's technically two doors. There's a gate that comes at the top of the uh, the stairs, but really when, when talking about the operator door, the operator door is the man door. Um, that separates the operator platform from the um, from the saw center section area, and it has a safety switch on it to prevent the door from being opened when the saw is running. So that control panel or cabinet is a, <clears throat> um, you know, a three foot wide uh, control cabinet with all the electronics and a touchscreen on top. Um, on the right, you can see the back side of that cabinet is where we keep our oiler. Uh, the oiler is a is a three gallon. A uh, pot of uh, saw, saw and bar chain oil that is um, pneumatically pressurized to provide oil to the saw whenever the saw is running. And you, we're going to be talking about that, that later. So the center section is really where the, all the action takes place. Um, starting with the top down, um, on the very tippy top of the uh, of the of the columns, there is the saw bar, um, gearbox, and motor. So it's when we're talking about the saw bar, we're meaning it, we're moving the saw bar up and down. Um, it's not the saw chain motor, which is a, a different, and you'll see that in a, here in a second. We're also, if, you, if we're ever referring to the 10 by 10s, 10 by 10s are basically the big 10 inch by 10 inch columns that make up the um, the arch that supports the saw on, on both sides. Um, if we're just going straight down, the slider is the, um, on the operator pan, operator side of the saw bar, 
and it is what has the bearings that ride on um, any side or both sides of the of the 10 by 10 column. It's what supports the the bar on the the take up side. The take up itself is that um, on the far end of the bar, which is closest to the operator platform, it's what provides tension for the chain um, with the the, the take up wheel. And we'll cover that in a minute. Uh, the saw box is basically the what we refer to the unit that holds the motor and the bar and the and rides up and down on the uh, linear linear bearings. Um, it's the, probably the most complicated part part of your machine and the most critical for its accuracy because it does everything from its accuracy of the travel as well as the accuracy of holding the saw bar square. Um, so again, that saw bar is the, the black going across, and then. <clears throat> Down below the saw is the encoder doghouse. So you hear the word encoder a lot, and the encoder is the digital device or the device that turns digital motion into um, a digital measurement. And sometimes we refer to that doghouse, which is that cover over the um, the encoder to prevent any end trims from ever damaging the encoder. Um, so we'll get that again. You'll see that here in a minute. But the encoder is just that digital device. It is associated with digital measuring. So here's a little bit more detail of your um, saw box. So the saw box again is what is moving up and down the linear rails. Um, and the far, uh, the far left you'll see is the drive sprocket. So the drive sprocket is bolted to the directly to the motor itself. So um, here at Pacific Trail we don't have any. Um, linkages or pulleys or belts or or any bearings between the, the saw motor itself to the drive sprocket uh, which is just one less piece for us to uh, for, for for one less piece to wear out for you for you guys um, and so that drive sprocket does have a shelf life um, or a life of not a shelf life but a life um, once it gets you know where it once it wears out over a couple of years um, the the teeth of the gear it's of the of the chain itself will dig into there and you eventually need to have that replaced. So that's just one thing to to pay attention to to watch for wear. Um, I wanted to point out in the the up in the upper left the saw bar limit the saw bar limit switch bracket. So when you are moving the uh, saw bar up and down, it automatically stops the top and bottom of the stroke. That limit switch that is fixed on the 10 by 10 can be tripped meaning it, it gets hit and stops when the when the limit switch hits that bracket <clears throat> and so if you guys were cutting a bunch of short units for instance you'd be able to actually raise that that um that, that bracket up so that the saw bar didn't have to travel all the way to the top um, it's something to save time it's a little bit of a risk because if you ever forget to move it back down and then and then um, bring a unit of lumber in and you don't have the saw all the way up um, it risks a big crash. So unless you're doing it all, almost all the time, I recommend leaving it where it's where it is uh, when we ship it, and allows you to have the saw bar all the way to the top to make sure that there's no crashes. So on the right side uh, is a kind of a detailed close-up picture of kind of the guts of uh, probably the most pre precise part of the machine. So you have the very top. There's a um, six foot long ball screw. So the ball screw is the big Acme thread looking thing that um, is a, like a two and a half, two inch diameter shaft that's threaded. And as it spins, that's what controls the linear motion and push and pull of the of the whole saw bar and saw box up and down those linear rails. Um, the ball nut itself is what is has a bunch of ball bearings that uh, is housed. I highly recommend paying attention to, to that um, if you ever need to replace it because those hundreds of balls inside of there will fall out if you don't ever pay attention to its procedures. So just a heads up there. But uh, I, di I digress. The ball nut flange is the flat horizontal piece and is actually um, separate from the ball nut and can be threaded in and out so that you can replace the ball nut without having to take the entire flange and everything else off. What I wanted to point out was that if you notice that those nuts <clears throat> don't look very tight on there, and I over exaggerated that just to, sh to show a point that those nuts are not supposed to ever be tight. There should always be a 
30 or 50 thousandths, you know, 30 second of an inch or more gap uh, between the nuts and that flange. And I wanted to point that out before um, I ever forget, because it's one thing that will slowly cause problems if, if someone ever tightens those down. It allows the whole, um, it prevents pinching, let's say, and, and, and stress on the linear bearings and the ball screw um, by having those allow them to float. Um, anyway, small details. The linear rails, again, they're what really control the precision linear motion of the vertical stroke. So those are the linear rails and the linear bearings are what are extremely tight together um, and allow for the precision that we can for the 1 32nd of an inch. Those are something that need, the linear bearings need to be great greased uh, on a weekly basis um, and, it's, and, and will be covered later in its maintenance manual. But those are some of the, the nomenclatures that I wanted to cover that you'll eventually probably be discussing over the phone or whatever it is. And we want to make sure that we're talking the same language. So Euler, again, this was the uh, op located on the operator platform, um, but this is the what we call the Euler. So it's really a, um, it's like a paint pressure pot that um, you fill with uh, clean bar and chain oil and pressurize with uh, at least 25 pounds of PSI. But the regulator should be, reg you should regulate it down to 25 PSI and not all the way up to the standard 80 or 90 or whatever your incoming air is. And it's marked. It's it's etched on the top of the uh, the actual pot itself, so that if the operator forgets. But that's one of the th that's one of the things just to set and forget, um, as well as its flow control. So once you dial in the flow uh, of how much bar and chain oil you want to use, depending on either your environment, um, if you know some people it has to be a little bit uh, more because of the uh, the cold or or weather hot weather that they're in. Um, Again, it's a flow control that allows the bar and chain oil to get delivered to the saw bar itself. And it's controlled by a solenoid that actuates a valve. And the solenoid actuates a valve whenever it is, um, whenever the saw bar is on. So those are all just the individual pieces. Um, again, if you're, you can either refer to this whenever you need something, if something breaks, or you can just take a picture of it and send it to us. But those are the, the common parts of the, the oiler. So back to safe, back to again, a little bit, a little bit, this, um, a part that kind of is a, a little bit safety or very safety, but some of the details of that this is not intuitive to most people. So there is a this is a safety pull cable switch shown here in, in the yellow, and there's two of these switches on the on the machine, one on each side of the operator platform. And there's tension that's set on this yellow cable that runs around the entire machine, and it is set in between a high and low limit, so that if someone either bumps into it, falls into it, or pulls the cable, it stops the machine just like you're hitting the e-stop or the emergency stop, and it shuts down power to everything. When you ever accidentally or purposely hit this and activate this switch, um, you need to be able to press the blue button in order to physically reset. So there is a physical reset button on this and is different than the digital reset that's on the operator platform itself. Um, oh, I forgot to also mention that the, the tension that is set on that entire rope or that cable is displayed in the window that you can actually see there with a little red tick mark. And there's a couple different, there's a there's three lines, there's two black lines and a red line. And it, the tension needs to be set in between those two black lines. And if it ever goes out from either someone hitting the cable or you'll be able to ever lose tension or whatever it is, it will shut down the machine um, power as soon as this the safety switch trips. Um, I think that's what everything I covered on that. So here's a video of some basic operation um, really uh, on the machine startup. So it's a it's kind of an older video, but want to sit here and watch it.
So that was the basic operation. And I also wanted to, to cover some of the touchscreen basics that we they breezed over, but wanted to explain a little further. Is there supposed to be sound on this video or no? Oh, are, can you guys not hear it? No, uh, I, I couldn't hear the uh, other one either. OK, <laughs> um, then it's not coming through the presentation. And I will point that out when I'll send you guys the, the videos themselves. Um, OK. Didn't, didn't realize it wasn't coming through the presentation. All right. Um, that's a bummer. OK, sorry about that. Um, but either I can send send you I can I'll, I'll be able to send you guys this 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 video and or um, a list of these videos for, for you guys to to watch. Okay. Um, but basically, he was showing that it's um, in this case just the 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 control of using the potentiometer as well as then showing the the saw bar up and down. Um, with the, let me go back. You okay? So. The, so you're saying basically when you're at let's say 15 or 17 percent roughly or you'll see you'll be able to see um the, the saw chain amps that he's talking about uh -huh. is that the the chart right there that shows when you're you want to run it at 15 to 17 amps on the chain amps um anytime it goes below the 17 amps it's too high it's either you're cutting too fast or your chain is too dull okay and then just the, the chart there so that if you're because we we have everything in digital um, position um if, if you have you know just a, a conversion chart and anything that is let me pause that anything there that is um shown in green um grayed out is just basically it's not it's not tripped or it's not um and anytime it sh highlights in green that is showing that the limit switch has been tripped so right now you can see that the the saw bar itself is all the way up um, and none of the in feed, out feed um, limit switches are actually tripped. And so as he's moving the, I believe this, the lift arms up, you can see the out feed lift arms were always, you know, now he's moving them down. The lift, lift arms are down. And then there's the, the, the chain the reset encoder. So the button itself, again, there, here's that encoder word. Um, I, we're changing that to actually pos say position because really what you're doing is you're resetting the position you, from the encoder. Uh, resetting the, once you hit that reset encoder like you did, you saw that the position went to negative 0.35. And negative 0.35 is actually the width of the kerf, the width of the saw chain itself. And so that is so that when you move to the next position, you take into account the width of your kerf so that where, where you cut is exactly the length of the material that you're going to produce. Mm -hmm. Hey Taylor, backing up to the amps really quick. So you're yeah. saying anytime you're cutting, if you're pulling more than 17 amps off that motor, you're either cutting too fast or the chain's too dull. Correct. Yeah. And so it's also then the chain count there. So you can then look at um, how many on that, how many chains that, how many cuts did that, um, that set a chain or that that chain loop how, how many have you done so you can be like oh you know i'm at 120 like yep that's this is making sense I, you know I, I i'm really having to slow it down in order to maintain that seven you know not below 17 or wherever wherever you find that you like to be um and you'll know that okay i'm going to change the chain even if it's you know 110 you know who knows what if, you know if you ran through some staples or whatever happened um it's you know it's good feedback and not just go by number of cuts do you guys throw up an alarm that you make the operator acknowledge or anything like that? No, but we do have. Um, no, because it, it, under certain conditions or certain we we don't want to hamstring the operator from um, if 
if in certain scenarios. Um, I'll, I'll explain later on on where we do reduce the speed, but when it when it is manually operated, um, we we wanted to give them the freedom to to not hamstring them from doing something they need to do. Okay. Okay. Um. Oh, here we go. Okay, so. Now, kind of back to some of the other basics that we we dove into a little bit of the operation, but um, really wanted to discuss, I guess, unit prep. So the the unit itself, um, depending on where it's coming in, is either going to have some pieces of wood um, not flush up against, you know, it's not going to be a perfect rectangular cube because of start stops and starts from either the um, the, the rail it was on or the truck it was on and either using a an in an in unit aligner to to square up those ends will reduce the amount of scrap that you you cut off and waste um, or simply a, just a sledgehammer to tap them back if, if you if you guys typically get some great units um, and if doing an interim um, you want to make sure to pull back your paper if you have any um, and secure it back so that it, the end of the paper doesn't get sucked up into the uh, the chain itself. Um, the chain will cut through that paper just like it's not even there. But if there is on the end of it, if 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 when it does, if it cuts off a small chunk, it might suck that small chunk back on. So that's why the end trims are important to cut pull the paper back. Um, but if you're cutting a, in the middle of a unit, you don't need to cut um, or pull the paper back. You can cut right through it. But again, uh, that's just on an interim. And then what you want to do is mark any of your cut locations. And, and I'm, we're not talking precision marks, but it's just it, it helps if you just throw a, throw a tape measure on there and um, put a, a sharpie or a big you know a big sharpie mark r roughly where you're going to be cutting. What this does is it also allows you to help quickly pull any staples in that area um, on the cut marks. If let's say you happen to have a staple that's Within an inch, you know, or half an inch of where you're going to be cutting, or rough that rough cut, cut, you want to pull those staples just because staples are do eat up your chain. Um, that also gives you some freedom here on some of the loading. So you want to make sure that the unit is as tight up against the backstops in a square cut, and I'll cover that in a second. But to do that. You're going to move the carriage all the way back to the end feed. So the end feed here is shown on the left. If you have a right to left flow, it'll be on the right. Um, and it's the end feed is again with those that backstop upstop upright rollers. And what you want to do is is with your forklift raise the unit at roughly six to eight inches above the carriage, um, with the leading end of the unit that no closer than four inches from the leading end of the carriage. So you don't want the the front of the carriage to be totally flush with the front of the unit uh, because the it causes slight problems with where you're measuring from because the that gear rack that I showed you is only two inches from the end it doesn't go all the way to the very tip because of that lead in so what you're going to do is is hover it hover it above the carriage six to eight inches and then lightly push the unit against the backstop rollers when I'm saying lightly it's just basically you're, you're trying to square it up roughly right now um, in order to then hop off the forklift and place your dunnage, again, those are those four by fours, either wood or aluminum. You want to place them within 12 inches of the cut. Um, closer the better, because you're going to support your cut and prevent any kerf collapse. Um, kerf collapse is basically the, the uh, collapsing of the boards in towards the cut because of lack of support. Um, that happens because of stickers or just because of the, the weight itself of the um, but majority of the time it happens because your dunnage, your four by fours are either wood or they've been been worn out and they're not evenly, um, they're not flat. So again, w w once you've have, you've have placed those, those that's dunnage, and again, this was why you wanted to mark your unit itself so that you don't just guess and accidentally then cut into your, um, your dunnage, which then damages your dunnage and you have to replace it. So marking that is again, it takes a couple seconds, but helps you when you're then placing the dunnage for your cuts. So, so after placing the dunnage, you can see here in the upper over right or on, on the right side, uh, we're going to be cutting two units of lumber. 
and we're going to be doing a, a single in trim or a single um, internal cut right down the middle. So you can see why those pieces of those four by fours that are sticking out have are close in the center. That also then gives you easy access for for unloading um, with the forklift. Uh, once you've once you've then lowered it onto the dunnage itself, you're going to then number six lightly finally push against the rollers. This ensures that you didn't slide away from the, the unit when you were lowering, uh, lowering. Let's say the mass was at an angle. Whatever you did, you as you lowered it, it pulled away from the uh, from the rollers. You want to go ahead and either just drive forward slightly or just to do a, 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 a light tilt of the mast to push the unit up against the, the rollers again. We don't want to be taking a you know 30,000 pound forklift and you know, ramming it up against the back of the rollers, um, which will eventually uh, put too much stress on the rollers themselves. Um, but they're 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 very beefy. Um, just wanted to just point that out. But again, squaring up the rollers to ensure that the forks, um, and then when you're backing out, ensure that the forks don't drag um, on either side of the, of the of the either the carriage or the lumber itself to move the lumber. And this is my over exaggerated example of why you want to make sure that it's up against the roller just for visual. So on the left, you have a nice square roller or a square unit to the machine. And where that blue line is, is your cut line. And so you can see that it's cutting nice rectangular shapes. But on the right, my over exaggerated um, unit that's not square, you're actually going to be worse is if you didn't do an end trim. If you did an end trim, you're going to be creating a parallelogram, which you know, you might not cause any problems, but if you didn't do an end trim and you just did an internal cut, you're going to be cutting not only a rhombus, but you're going to be cutting in inaccurate because you can see on that rhombus that that far side length is much shorter than that that near side length, um, and you're going to be having some inaccurate cuts. So again, placing it as square as possible will affect your accuracy. Hey Taylor. Yeah. On that, where do you usually see signs that? units are being rammed into those rollers is it breaks in the well between the base and the pedestals um it's it's actually more in the wearing out of the um um of the uh the, the, roller, bearing, bearing. the, the roller, roller bearings themselves um those are um Heavy duty split bab bearings, so they're actually not roller bearings; they're split bab. Um, but they, those will eventually wear. Um, you probably could notice, let's say, the the welds in the um, in the gussets on the on either either end of the uh, of that backstop. Um, and you can always, you know, yearly or so check those welds and then check for squareness. Um, but as long as you're, as long as it's not over exaggerated um, of ramming with a really heavy forklift, we we really haven't heard much, many problems. So that that's not a high, um, a high likelihood of issues in my opinion. Did that did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So again, back to loading. I wanted to point out dunnage. Um, Dunnage on, needs to extend on both sides of the carriage um, because the lift arms need to be able to lift the dunnage itself off of the carriage. And if the dunnage was only in the uh, the width of the carriage, you wouldn't be able to lift the four by fours off of the um, off the the unit itself. And the, the it only lifts it an inch off of the carriage, so you you definitely need um, you can't lift units off of the four by four without using four or without four by fours. If the dunnage extends too far, and that's one of what I wanted what I wanted to point out, the, the picture on the right is a zoomed in picture of the left of where the dunnage is not interfering with the yellow upright roller. So if you placed the roller too far and it extended in between two rollers, when you then moved the carriage, you would crash the dunnage into the upright roller. So it, you either need to pay attention and check that, uh, either from um, marking your guys' four, wooden, four, wooden four by fours, uh, or however you guys need to do it, or just looking down and checking each time before going, however you guys want to do it. Uh, 
our dunnage sets that we produce are 4x4 aluminum, which is not only dimensionally accurate, but we also weld on a piece of angle iron that acts as a stop. So that on that on that final push that we talked about that helps to square it while it's um, actually resting on the 4x4s, it doesn't slide on the carriage itself. The unit slides on the 4x4s and not the and the 4x4s don't slide on the carriage because there's that stop. It actually also helps to quickly locate those uh, when the operator is hopping off the forklift, throwing the dunnage on the carriage, um, and just simply pushing it up against the, an end stop without having to quickly try to be accurate with where those need to be placed. So just an idea. Um, we've seen many people um, make their own, put some, um, screw in some some wooden stops on their 4x4s, however they want to do it. Um, it. There's many different ways of doing it, but just wanted to point that out as why that is there. Okay, so I don't have, don't have a picture for this, but this is after you've loaded a unit onto a carriage. Um, let's say that we are we need to zero out the end trim or zero out the um, that leading end. So we're not going to be doing a, a leading end trim. We're going to be doing it in, let's say, an internal cut. And you need to know where you're going to be cutting. We're going to, after placing the unit, we're going to use the joystick and the speed control. Um, just like in those videos, he was using the speed control and the joystick, bringing the entire carriage into the um, and under the saw bar. Um, the speed control you want to, I recommend as you're trying to get closer. There is a series of bars, and once you use the, um, the speed control more often, you'll see you'll you'll get a feel for it. Of of once you get to two bars on the speed, that's a good good speed for final placement. And so what, once we what, what we're looking for is we're positioning the unit such that the laser that is shining down across the top of the um, of the saw bar and onto the uh, unit itself. We want that la laser line to split on the leading edge. So meaning you don't want to see the entire width of the saw bar or of that laser. You want it so that it's half on and half basically disappearing so that you're barely seeing it. And one of the tip that I'd like to, to communicate is that it's easier to use the speed control dial to actually stop it and precisely stop it at where you need to instead of using the joystick. It also wears out your joystick less or the life of your joystick rather than trying to, to have your, you know, turn on your joystick at a fast speed, but only turn it on for a millisecond, which would then just wear out the, the, the joystick itself. So using that, that, that dial, the potentiometer, to control where it is and then quickly turn it to zero is a much faster and accurate way to stop at a precise location. Once you have hit that, um, that far end, um, meaning your laser where it is, that is then when you want to press the encoder reset on the touch screen. That was what you saw on one of the, the main center at the top, and it sets the position back to negative 0.35. That's actually the width of your chain or the curve thickness itself. Um, so guys, I'm also realizing, uh, looking at the clock, um, either we, you know, we started a few minutes late, but at the same time, I want to make sure you guys didn't have a hard stop at eight because I'm probably only about, I'm on slide 23 of 40. So we're just over the halfway point of, of things. I'm thinking we'll probably be another 30 minutes or so. Does that work with your guys' schedule? Yeah. Okay. Um, so again, basic operation of now after we've zeroed out the, uh, the, the position on the, um, on the screen on the touch screen sorry uh, you want to use the joystick and speed control again turn up the speed move the carriage to it, its final cut position uh, i'm using the again potentiometer to, to dial down the speed just like before to hit your 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 position exactly um and also just to be clear the joystick doesn't it's either off or on it, there on the joystick it's not a um it doesn't read um, partial movement, so you can't just tap it. It's either going to be a fully on or fully off, which is why it's easier to quote unquote tap it using the um, the, the speed control to start and stop quickly or accurately. 
So this was again the here is what we saw on the, on the HMI. You saw that there's the the position speed has been reset and it shows the negative 0.35 in the upper left. Um, to the right of that position is the reset encoder. Whenever you reset the encoder, it really resets the position. So I wanted to point that out there. So we're let's say we're we're in position and your position read you know 101 and three quarters or whatever you were using for for your this cut length um, and you're ready to cut you would then use the joystick and speed control to move the saw bar down um, after i'm sorry number one again start the, the the saw chain motor the saw chain motor is i think shown in that video that's a physical button or a physical switch that that fires up the motor uh, bring it bring the saw chain or the saw bar down um, when, when you start to cut, you want your speed control roughly at about the 15% mark or the 15 mark on the on the on the dial, not on the uh, amperage or anything else, but on the on the dial itself. It's right around that 15% out of 100 um, on the speed control. Uh, what you want to do is be monitoring, have your hand on that um, that dial while you're watching the bar or the saw chain amps. So shown on the right, it's the chain amps. You want to keep to maintain between 15 and 17 amps and use your speed control for the up and down, the bar up and down to probably hit around two minutes of timing and keeping that saw chain um, amperage between 15 and 17 amps. If you're if you have the time and you're not you know crazy pressed for production and can extend to slower cuts of like three or four minutes, everything is going to wear out um, slower. Your chain is going to probably last longer. Your bars are going to last longer. All of your bearings are going to be be happier. You're going to put less stress on that machine just because you're letting the saw chain cut instead of pushing through the cut itself. Um, everything is going to be happier and last longer if you have that extra minute or two um, during the cut. At the bottom of the cut, the saw bar will automatically stop when we when it hits that limit switch. Um, the light will come on where it says saw down. You can then turn off your saw chain and um, we'll talk about what to do next um, after that. Because what you want to do is raise the bar. Again, confirm that, you know, listen, look, confirm that the saw chain motor has stopped. Um, if the cut was an in trim, so if you cut off an inch and all of the inch long pieces fell fell down and into the um, conveyor, you can simply just just raise the raise the bar right then. But if it's an internal cut, imagine you, you've created a um, a gap in the wood that is exactly the width of the chain. So as you're then raising it, if there is any movement of that chain or if it pinches or whatever it happens, you're going to cause a problem because you're going to be grabbing the chain and pulling the chain and it might break your chain or it might pinch the bar and you cause problems. What you want to do is raise the lift arms. So again, those lift arms were those yellow arms that, that ran the whole length of the uh, the outfeed side. And when you raise those lift arms, it not only raises the, the unit, but it, it, it rotates it away from the bar and it provides an extra half inch or so of clearance between the unit and the half of the chain in the bar. And so that relieves any of the cur curve pinch or collapse and gives it more clearance to come up. And that way you then can fire it up to 50% and slide it up and everything's good. So you can raise the bar after the, that um, the lift arms are up and then raise the chain. And then you can lower the lift arms. You have to lower the lift arms so that you don't drive, uh, so that the unit is back on the carriage. And then if you have another cut, you can move it to your next cut sequence and repeat, or you can move it all the way to the end and unload if you had only had a single cut. Any questions with that? No. Okay. So unload. Um, really, you're, after you've moved the carriage to the end of the outfeed rails, um, the, out, the the carriage will stop because you hit the limit switches on the far end. Uh, raise those lift arms in order to, to lift the unit and the dunnage, of those 4 by 4s off the carriage itself. And then move the carriage. Just move the carriage all the way back to the end feed. Um, and the, the, the units are going to be sitting on the lift arms. And the reason to do that is um, when you're unloading the units, the, the worst thing you can do to the carriage is hit the carriage with your, with your forks. We know that guys are zooming around at full speed and thinking that they're always going to hit the, you know, they're they're never going to hit anything. They're never going to 
miss their pockets, um, but we know that's going to happen. And when if you're zooming in with the forklift and you hit those carriages on the side, you're, you're putting stress on the those V wheels that are the accuracy um, that, of your machine. And so as you're banging those and bending those V wheels or uh, breaking those bearings, you, you don't really notice it until you have a problem and it's long down the line and um, it's it, it's just good to get it out of the way and prevent any issues with 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 those forks again, damaging the, uh, the the carriage itself. So just get in the habit of using the lift arms, moving the carriage out of the way before it gets unloaded. Um, so some of these advanced controls, there are these three buttons in the bottom right. And really they're they're called advanced controls because they're they're semi-automated um, processes. They don't automate the entire process. They don't you know move the carriage. Um, but what they do do is allow you to start a process that you're very comfortable with um, and allows you to um, either pay attention to somewhere else or just um, you know, Anything that's a very uh, uh, you know repetitive process you know, actually allows you to potentially step off the platform and go do something like prep a unit. You only want to do this. I would recommend maybe six months after the operator is completely comfortable with the material he's cutting, um, understanding you know if he's cutting with a dull chain every, every, and everything else. Uh, because once you hit these buttons and walk away, the only thing you can do if there's an issue is to pull that e-stop e e cable that goes around the machine, which is why it's there, um, or run back up and hit the e-stop or slow something down. Um, but when you're cutting something that you cut it all day long and every day and you've been doing it for a few months, this that's the time to um, start using some of these buttons to, to help you save time. So um, again, we're not going to have video that. Uh, so I'm not sure how I'm going uh, we'll go ahead and click this. So these three buttons, uh, this first one is the full, basically the, the, the most automated solution. So while the, the joystick is, is in the center position, you can, with the side, turning the hydraulic pump on, the side chain on, uh, you can press this button, and what it does is when you press it, it automatically starts the bar bar moving down. Um, and so it's it, what it's going to do is start moving down at the speed that you have physically have it set at. So once you set up what you know a, a speed that you're comfortable cutting at, um, and that's that's the point of literally once it engages, you can check your amps, and then you'd probably walk away. What this does is it's going to stop the bar at the bottom. And he's gonna he's gonna fake it like it is. Um, if you ever have a problem, you can always push it up, which is showing you is even in the middle of a cut. If you if it hits anything, you run in, you push it up, it's not causing any problems. And then when you bring it back down, um, it it's it still maintains um, or not down, but even to the center position, it's still in that automated function. Um, so that you can if you ever had a reason to to, to pause it, let's say. Um, at the bottom of the cut stroke, oh, he tripped it already, so it, it pretended like it, it was the bottom. The lift arms raise, to, again, to relieve any curved collapse, and the saw bar comes up. So if you were outside, that button would do the most for you if you were prepping another unit. So it's kind of a semi-automated process. Um, the next one is the same thing, but rather than coming all the way up, um, it just stops at the bottom of the uh, um, of the cut and allows you to, to if you have to play with the uh, the check for kick check for whatever you need to before coming back up if you're having a lot of curve collapse or if you're cutting stuff with a lot of stickers um, things like that um, I'm not going to go through that since you don't have audio but the the, the last one is an in trim cut so on in trim cuts you can move the bar all the way to the top without having to raise the lift arms because there's no curve collapse. So it's just basically, it's just like the the first one where it's gonna raise the bar back all the way up, but it's not gonna raise up and take the time to lift the the, the outfeed lift arms. And those you guys can watch um, when you guys have audio. So um, 
this is just a, 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 a way of showing the, the simplest way for after your either your first cuts or even on a, a weekly basis um, of checking the machine's accuracy. And the easiest way of doing it is really just doing a, a, um, a cut with two end trims, or at least with an end trim. Um, if you're able to, to basically do a leading end trim and a tailing end trim, and you're measuring all four corner boards. So the corner boards, again, are what that's pointed at is in the, the the upper back, upper front, lower front, and lower back length of the boards. It tells us if we're cutting a, a, a rectangular unit or if we're cutting a parallelogram or a rhombus like like we showed. So let's say if you were cutting a exactly a um, you know 101 inch long unit and the the upper back was 101 and, and 132nd and the the lower front was um, 101 and um, minus a 32nd you knew that you were within that plus or minus 32nd but if you're creating something that's not within that window helping to communicate or identifying which board was off will tell you a lot of what might have happened or if your bar is um, out of square um, or if it's just if what something's going on. So simply measuring those four boards and not just one board um, is a good way of checking the um, the accuracy of the machine. Um, <clears throat> this is a more complicated way of checking the encoder. So sometimes if, let's say you crash the encoder, um, if the, um, if a NTRAM fell in it, in it um, jammed and you, you you had a crash that you didn't realize um, and the encoder was um, spinning on a um, you know that that shaft itself was bent or maybe if it if it if there was a bunch of sawdust in the teeth or something was going on and you're you're not getting your accuracy anymore this is a way to isolate the encoder and check to see if hey is my carriage moving exactly the length that I say it is um, and instead of you know blaming it on the saw chain or the saw bar, or the, the, lots of other components. This is a way of of checking the encoder for it. It's just when I move the carriage, does it move exactly where it's supposed to go? So really, what you're going to do is you're you're moving the carriage into the lift arms. You're going to then reset the encoder, and after you reset it, go ahead and bump it from 0.35 to the, actually exactly to zero so that it reads 000. After you've read 000, um, open, the, open the safety door so that everything is uh, not going to move, maybe lock out, tag out, if you, if you, um, and walk over there and use a straight edge. And in the upper picture, you can see where transferring that the front edge of the carriage onto the lift arm and to make a mark or put a, or put a piece of tape and make a mark. And that way you, you identify where you're starting at the 000 mark. And then you get back into the operator platform, you reset your safeties, and you move the position to exactly, let's say, 100, 100 inches. You could do 200 inches right off the bat, but sometimes I like just to do two increments, one at 100, and then mark it, and then move it to 200 inches, and then mark it. And that way you get um, checks on the entire section of the full length of the carriage um, to make sure that you are within, uh, that your digital measuring was accurate. Because if then if you moved 100 inches and your, um, or if you're, I'm sorry, if the digital position showed 100 inches, but the physical marks you measured were only 99 point, you know, 75, and you missed the whole quarter inch, you know that, hey, if my carriage is, is off by that much, something's going on and it has nothing to do with my saw bar and it's my digital measuring that is causing the inaccuracy of my, uh, my cuts. And then it helps to isolate what where the actual issue is. So, checking the checking the encoder is a good thing to do, and to know that it's um, that the that the position itself is is accurate. There is an entire troubleshooting guide for you guys that goes through this in more detail and some of the more um, complicated alignment issues, such as the saw bar motion, or even the the squareness of the saw bar. Um, and so rather than covering that today, I'm um, just making you guys aware that there is a, a dedicated guide that is pretty extensive that with pictures and uh, walks you through all the different accuracy checks of your machine.
but really today I just wanted to cover kind of the two basics of the how do you check to see if you're if you're cutting um, what lengths yes. and where to measure, and then how to 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 measure the encoder if you, before um, to help isolating where you guys have problems. But those both of those two things are in this troubleshooting guide as well. Um, so I wanted to cover some of the setup stuff um, of operating a new machine or some of the setups of um, a new operator. Um, so the saw bar requires oil to reduce wear in the saw between the saw bar and the saw chain as it's being drugged through the cut. Um, there on that oiler itself, which is what you see in front of us, the solenoid is actually a magnetic device that as when energized, it opens the valve to allow the flow um, from the pressurized pot up and out the, the tube and eventually onto the saw bar. Uh, the flow control basically reduces that so that you're not wasting a lot of saw bar oil. Um, the, like I said, said before, the regulator should be set at 25 PSI. Um, one thing to note on a, on a setup is some people might go, oh, that there, this nut that's on the solenoid that holds that holds it to the valve is it isn't completely tight. We don't want it completely tight. We want it only finger tight. There's even a note on most of them that says finger tight only. If you over tighten that nut, it'll eventually burn out your solenoid prem prematurely. So again, something that's not intuitive, but wanted to point that out here. Um, setting the flow control is both a visual and audible um, thing. So if you can, as you're starting a new chain that's kind of that's that's semi dry um, and started up, you'll you'll hear it sound kind of rough. And once you then get once that oil starts flowing, um, once you hear it physically and you're not seeing a bunch of overspray from the um, from the oil being spit out, you know that that's kind of the area where you are where you should be. Um, there's it's a hard line to to. Um, to dial to a specific flow rate because of your temperature, what what type of cha uh, oil you're using requires more PSI. We've just found at 25 PSI um, that helps set a, a good flow without spitting out too much um, and or it doesn't change much when it is um, at different temperatures, different viscosities of chain oil or, or whatnot. Um, there, I wanted to point out there is a set screw on that flow control. So if you if you guys have problems with operators changing it or messing around, once once you figure it out, just go ahead and set use that little Allen Allen head to set the set the set screw so that nobody can tinker with the the flow control. So saw chain tensioning. Um, this is not intuitive, and some people might think that oh I'll just do it by feel and it's fine. Well, it's really not. Um, you want to have them use the tools provided to set the tension. Um, this chain over here on the right shows Carlton. We don't use Carlton anymore, but it shows a good diagrams of at 17 pounds of force. That's what it should take to pull the saw chain three quarters of an inch away from the um, away from the bar at the belly of the bar. So it's different if you pull it at the tip of the bar versus the belly of the bar. So when you're setting it use a the tension scale that is provided you hook it around the chain you pull down not up in this case like it is showing um, but you pull down at a 17 pounds of force and then you set your calipers to three quarters of an inch and there's a little set screw on the on the calipers so that you can visually hold your set of calipers up to the gap and, de and determine okay at roughly 17 18 you know 16 pounds of pulling down am i at three quarters of an inch you don't need to sit there and be within, you know, my, you know, mil thousands of an inch to three quarters of an inch. It's again a, a rough thing, but using these two devices gets you way closer than just trying to get doing it by feel. Um, so as you adjust that butterfly that sets the tension um, in your take-up unit on the uh, on the far end of the the bar, that's how you set your your tension properly. It is to want to note that a new chain. Brand new first cut will stretch after its first cut, and you'll probably also get pretty well that you'll you'll feel uh, not feel, but you'll understand. Okay, after um, a first cut of a brand new chain, after I've set the tension, 
it takes a half a turn or th a third of a turn or whatever it is with, with your guys' uh, situation in order to reset that tension. So you you could probably get away with not having to to, to uh, measure it again, but once you retension it, um, you want to make sure that it's down to 17 and three quarters, especially if a new operator checking it each time. You don't need to check it after every, every cut, but just after that first cut of a new chain, it will stretch slightly and it will change the tension in your in your uh, chain itself. Just to be clear, the tension of the chain is important. Uh, for one, over tension is going to cause problems with some of the components, um, and not enough tension will cause problems by the chain itself pulling out of the cut and or creating an inaccurate cut. If you ever see a um, a cut that looks like a wave, um, like a Ruffles potato chip, the tension of the chain is probably one of the first things that is causing a problem. And it also could be the inside of your bar because you hadn't been properly tensioning it. If you don't tension it properly, the drive links that ride inside the groove of your saw bar then have more of an ability to rock side to side. And as you rock side to side inside the bar, you're wearing the bar in an area that can't be repaired. So that's one more reason to not wear um, unevenly on the inside of your rails. So diving into some of the maintenance. Um, you daily want to clean off and fill your oil pot. That's the, the in, in the oil, you wanna make sure it never runs out of um, saw bar oil. Um, if it's more than half full, you probably don't need to fill it, but you wanna check it every morning. If you um, don't blow it off and, and sawdust falls into the open pot of your saw bar and chain, it will contaminate it and likely clog that oil valve, which is not, um, easily recognizable, and then eventually you'll wear out the bar because you're not getting the proper oil. So blow off all the sawdust from the top of your oil before you open the lid. After you've blown it off, you'll then turn the, the, the ball valve, turning off the pressure to the air to the oil, and then use the, <coughs> I didn't finish this one, use the pressure relief valve to open it or to relieve the pressure before opening the top in order to fill the oil. Uh, a weekly thing to do is you want to grease the ball screws. So in this video, again, you're not going to be able to hear it, but I'll commentate. Commentate. Um, you'll see that this guy is a, has raised the saw box up to the top and, and is now applying oil using his pneumatic uh, or his uh, dessert fitting uh, device to simply push oil or push oil, push grease onto the ball screw itself. So that's what we, that, I remember the center section. That's the ball screw. It is a big threaded and spread that and get that all into um, as much as you can in the main section of the of the ball screw. After you've done that, you want to actually then get off the platform, reset all your safeties and move that saw box up and down to, to coat it um, and spread that out even better. Monthly, and again, that was that was weekly. Uh, monthly, use that same grease gun that was shown in there to grease the V-wheels of your carriage. You want to grease the upright roller bearings that are the backstops of your um, your infeed, as well as the lift arm grease grease um, fittings. Greasing the linear rail bearings, which are the um, on that the backside of where that saw box is. Uh, you don't want to punch pump a ton of grease in there. You just want to make sure that as you're pumping grease into there, it's pushing some of the old grease out that is ever contaminated to help preserve the balls. Um, again, we're also going to grease the carriage chain. So the carriage chain is what pulls and pull, uh, pulls the uh, carriage back and forth. Uh, we want to spray on some roller chain or any type of sp sprocket lube um, onto the chain itself. If you went, if you did that either, even did that uh, every other month, um, that one's probably not the, the the most important of, of those four. So you could probably stretch that one out a little bit longer than a month, but it, it's sometimes easier just to set it at, at a rhythm. This is done monthly. So um, it's not maintenance, but just wanted to cover saw chain itself. So again, I think we talked about this earlier, how long they should last, but <laughs> if it ever wears out prematurely because of your, your, don't hesitate to pull it off before it needs to, uh, be, you know, before you get to that 125. Maybe someone didn't resharpen it. Maybe someone resharpened it too fast um, and they they tempered some of the, uh, the, the cutters and it just didn't last as long. 
if you pull them off before it, it you get to that 125, it's safer and less expensive than causing problems with uh, your, your overall machine. And again, a dull chain is going to wear your saw bar and all the other components mo mo more quickly than a, than a sh sharp chain itself. Um, where you guys get your saw chain resharpened is important. And make sure that the, there is a, they are aware of some of the unique instructions that we have, that we also have a, a, um, an instruction panel with also just kind of a summary of the high level stuff that you can you can tear off and hand to someone who is more familiar with with cutting. But it's things like not touching the rakers, um, how much to, how much you can cut back and making sure that the the right and left hand cutters are, are even, which people who are not. Um, who are just typical chainsaw handheld chainsaw operators it doesn't matter to them but it definitely matters to you when you're trying to hold the 32nd of an inch for accuracy of the overall machine uh, saw bars themselves each of those should last uh, 2000 cuts on each side before they need to be sent back to us for reconditioning so again when after 2000 cuts you should you'll see a, a groove in the in the, in the one side of the of the uh, the bar, and you shouldn't run um, a deep groove because then you're going to be be breaking chains. You're going to cause a lot of problems um, that you are unaware of. Um, and I'll get to that in a second. But you, what you want to do is you you don't want to spend 2,000 cuts and then flip the bar and then use the other side. What you want to do is every 400 cuts or so, so roughly every third chain. When you're taking out the chain, you want to also take off the bar and, and flip it so that the top of the bar becomes the bottom of the bar. And that helps to wear each side evenly. Because if you wear out one side completely and you didn't even use the other side, you actually need to send it back in prior to using the other side because you, you can't you shouldn't run it when when you have a really deep groove on one side. And so that's the main reason why we we, we say flip it every third chain so that it wears evenly and you get the most out of your your uh, your bar itself. Um, we send the bars, we mail the bars with sandwiching between two boards, these one by 10 boards that are eight, you know, seven feet long or eight feet long. We ship it in those. They are not guaranteeing. All they're doing is they are helping to prevent chipping at, or chipping or damage to the outside of the bar when it's being shipped. It is not a guarantee of, hey, that's going to keep it nice and flat. If you ever even just lay them flat on the ground, there's a slight warp in the boards or maybe you're sitting on a nut or whatever you're doing or if worse if you're leaning the whole thing up against a, uh, a wall you're going to be putting a bend in that bar while it's sitting there so you what you want to do is you want to take them out of the boards you want to keep those boards and keep the the, um, the bolts for the boards but hang the bars up on a on a nail or on a bolt something where you can also visually see how many how many bars you have that way you can make sure you never run out of one or never a clean one. Um, and I guess what I'm, why I'm telling you that is so that you hang them up instead of lay them flat or lean them against something. Uh, when those are done for reconditioning, you can simply then, or need recondition and you're done with your 2000 cuts per each side or a, a 32nd of an inch groove, um, put those back in there, ship them back to us. We can recondition them probably about eight to 10 times before uh, it needs to be scrapped. And the reason why it would need to be scrapped is because there's hard facing or it's an inlay that eventually just wears out. And then it's cheaper to buy a new bar than it is to, to build up a brand new one or build up an old one. That was actually the last slide I had for you for today. Um, mm -hmm. There's quite a bit of stuff in the user manual as well as in this troubleshooting guide uh, that will help you guys go further down into the weeds of um, some of the details. But really what I hoped to get to done today was to be able to really walk you through some of the basic operation, um, have you guys be able to refer to this major subassemblies or parts either when describing it or, or reading it through the manual um, in order for you guys to to operate the machine both safely but and accurately.